Hi, everybody. Welcome to Leadership Book of the Month. I am Kelly Burns here with Brett Getzel and Dave Lingerfeld, and we are here today to talk about good power, uh, leading positive change in our lives, our work and world. So, hey, guys, welcome. Hey, Kelly. Hey, Brett. Hi. How are you guys? You want to do a, an introduction, a brief intro? Um, so we didn't do a pregame this month, so uh, let's do a brief intro. And if you have a quick update, you can do that at the same time. And uh, Brett, I'll invite you to go first. Sure, sure. Thank you, Kelly, and welcome, everybody. Uh, Brett Getzel, 34 years in the industry and truly uh, a work your way up from the bottom of the ladder kind of story. So, uh, you know, I don't know that I've ever shared this. I kind of was chuckling as I was putting together previous conversations, but my thoughts kept going back to that. Mike Rowe and his dirty job story. You guys have all seen that show. One of my very first jobs was as a live hog receiving supervisor. If you can imagine that at a very yeah. large packing plant, which involved literally counting and sorting, you know, as many as 7,000 hogs a day in preparation for processing. So like I said, truly a Mike Rowe dirty jobs kind of thing. But, uh, you know, here we are all those years later and senior executive training commodities in support of food service uh, and doing just really, really well. So, uh, I always kind of end that little piece, you know, with our listeners have probably heard the saying, it's not where you start, but where you finish. So if uh, you're one of those people that's in that station in life, it was certainly true in my case, and I'm sure it will be in yours as well. So in terms of updates, so I just did a fiscal planning workshop last month. And, you know, for those who are aligned with companies that are big, you know, scale, it's probably something that you're pretty familiar with. But, you know, I'm sure there are listeners in our audience that are entrepreneurs and startups and early stage companies and you know you're kind of learning as you go you know and, and it may be something that you're not doing now but i can assure you that an annual planning process is extremely valuable and it was kind of ironic as i'm sitting here thinking about what i wanted to share i get an email from the harvard business uh, review the harvard business store and the, what they were promoting was, you know, planning to win or playing to win strategy toolkit, which was all about, you know, developing strategy and having a planning workshop. So I thought, my gosh, you know, just when you need something from God here, it comes into your ear. There you so, go. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was so, so interesting. So, yeah, just you know, for a lot of folks, like I said, that are in that stage in that early startup piece, you know, they don't know where to start. And it's something you just got to get going. But for those of you who are you know about the Harvard Business Review store, uh, something you might want to check out. Awesome. Great resource. Thanks, Brett. Hey, Dave, how about you? Hey, thanks for having me again, guys. And another uh, fun book this month. So Dave Lingerfeld, ed educator, uh, kind of consultant. Uh, always love getting a chance to connect with you guys and uh, share the book of the month. It kind of helps keep us uh, all honest and, and motivated to ensure we're where we need to be. Um, it, Brett, I love the uh, dirty jobs reference. Uh, kind of like you, well, one of my first jobs was uh, I worked on a construction site, everything from operating a jackhammer to, you know, laying tile, you, you name it. And I, I wore my wife out watching the show Dirty Jobs and pointing to the various oh things. And going, I used to do that. I did that. I did that. Uh, yeah. So in, in those those days where I think it's hard sitting in the, the staff meeting I don't want to be in or, you know, writing a report I'm not a fan of, I always think back, uh, you know, you remember that uh, summer in July when you were uh, framing a deck in 102 degree temperature and 99% relative humidity? You want to go right. back to that? No, no, we don't. So I'm very happy uh, to be here uh, with, with both of you and to talk about our book this month. So. Awesome. Okay, so my first job was not like either of those. Um, my first paying job was at the church rectory. I answered the phone on on Sundays when the priest would go across the street to church. I would stay back and answer the phone for them. So, uh, Brett, when you said uh, it's not where you start, it's where you end up. Like I literally will end up at the same church. That's probably where I'll be buried and or have funeral <laughs> and everything. <laughs> I was That's married hilarious. in that church. <laughs> I had Ash Wednesday mass there last week. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, the book this month, she, her, she shared her story and, uh, and uh, that tied in. So that was good. Thank you, Brett. Um, and the whole purpose of these conversations is uh, for leaders who do want to continue their uh, leadership growth throughout their career. So we thank you for watching and and uh, chiming in. I have my phone handy. So if you um, do have a question, I don't think we can see questions or I can't see them if you post them while I'm in 
the app, but I can see them on the um, on LinkedIn on my phone. So if you um, have a question and you're live, you're welcome to post it in the comment section and we will be glad to um, answer it along the way or post a question, a comment, anything you want to chime in, feel free. We are happy to uh, have you, welcome you, uh, welcome you here. And then if you're watching the broadcast later, you're also welcome to chime in and we will uh, respond to that as well as we see those comments now and then. Um, so we, we, our aim is to inspire the leaders of tomorrow who are investing in themselves uh, today. And let's see, should we just dive right in? Everybody ready? Sounds good. All right. So the book this month is Good Power. So two of us read the book and Brett listens to the books usually. Uh, Leading Positive Change in Our Lives, Work and World from Ginny Rometty, who was the um, CEO of IBM. And let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, well, first, and the book came out last year in 2023 from Harvard Business School Publishing. And the reason we picked it was um, because of who she was as the CEO of IBM, just a stalwart in business. Also, I was curious about the PwC merger and to see if there was any inside scoop on that. And there was like way more than I thought there would be. Um, also, I'm involved in uh, AI in Kansas City on the AI Club uh, Steering Committee and was curious to see if she would talk about that and didn't go into as much on that, but uh, was um, excited to see some about that. So that's why we picked this book. And she does share ups and downs and different things about her leadership journey. Um, she is the um, current, she uh, left IBM a few years ago and is the founder and co-chair of 110. And the purpose of 110 is something that she talks about it toward the end of her book, um, which is kind of advocating for others. And, but during, um, during her time at IBM, let's see, um, she held several different roles there. She started at IBM in a, as a system engineer in 1981, and she left in April of, two, of 2020. She um, became president and CEO in 2012, and she held um, roles as the global head of, head of global sales, marketing, and strategy. She um, did some big things like the PricewaterhouseCoopers um, purchase, that was a big, huge thing. And uh, she talks in the book about her career would have been made or broken based on the role that she played there. Um, she also um, was a big player in the um, and, um, IBM's focus on analytics, on cloud computing, on um, the development of AI. She's been named to a lot of the leadership lists, the Bloomberg's 50 most influential people in the world, Fortune's Most 50 Powerful Women in Business, Times 20 Most Important People in Tech, um, a lot, several others. Um, let's see, she, her tenure wasn't all, um, all great tech and flowers and roses and rainbows. Um, there was pushback just like there would be in, if a man was leading the company during that time. Um, her, she had a, a rough childhood. Um, her parents divorced and her father left, left the family with nothing when she was 15. So uh, she learned a lot from that experience. And she talks a lot about that in her book. Um, she went to Northwestern and she talks about having the opportunity to go to Northwestern and how that came about. Um, she graduated from Northwestern with high honors and she uh, with a uh, bachelor's degree in computer science and electrical engineering. Um, she is married and uh, doesn't have children, and she divides her time between New York and Florida. Um, I also thought it was interesting. She's one of only a few women um, who are members of Augusta National Golf Club. And oh, really? Yeah. Okay, I have a lot more, but I think that's enough for, about for her bio, for her background. So um, the book is divided into three into three sections and it's um the first is the power of, of of me of one and it's changing a life and then the power of we changing work or yeah we yeah we changing work isn't it and then the power of us changing the world um and she says the purpose of her book is that when she was getting ready to retire people kept saying oh you should write a book and um 
So she didn't really want to write one that was only about her. She wanted it to have a bigger purpose. So um, she wanted to look at her journey that of her life that she had gone through and what did it teach her. And so that's what she came up with these three, um, three areas. And um, it all kind of leads to how we can use these lessons that she shares to change the world. So first, I'm going to just tee it up and ask for general comments. So general thoughts about the book. Um, Dave, I'll ask you to, if you want to go first. Yeah, um, obviously coming, as I've shared several times from a tech background, I, I, I enjoyed the book. Um, you know, I for me, I always love getting to, you know, kind of hear these stories about the the nature of tech and, you know, what they went through in certain eras of tech. And I, I felt from the start, she did a very good job, you know, talking about, you know, punch card programming and, you know, how very meticulously carried these cards into the computer lab, you know, to get her opportunity to process the cards. You know, uh, it, it makes, it, for me, it helps build a greater appreciation for what technology is capable of today. And one thing I always try and uh, do with my students is, is talk about the history of technology, but not spin it from the angle of, you don't realize how hard it was in my day, rather the angle of, hey, I I'm telling you this because I I'm very grateful that you don't have to go through what I went through and that I didn't have to go through what the generation before me went through. So um, I, I thought she did a really good job. Uh, you know, painting that picture. So, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I thought, thought it was uh, really good. I enjoyed getting to kind of hear her her tech story and, of course, her her perspective of a an early pioneer of of one, women a woman advancing in technology that was and and still is, you know, mostly male dominated. Mm -hmm. And 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 your students, I hope they are able to envision what will it be in the next generation. You know, that's what so I want. Amazing. Challenging right you know telling those stories of you know what what here here's what it used to be like here's what it is now what what will it be like if you're standing up here talking about it to students in 20 years yeah Great point. awesome awesome brett what about you general thoughts comments about the book yeah i, yeah, I, I just wrote i said you know jeannie's got a great story to tell i mean and she does a very very good job of unpacking her journey which i found be quite fascinating. We talk about that throughout the conversation today, but the part that was really kind of revealing for me is not coming from the tech space. Unlike Dave, I had, if you would have asked me what IBM meant, you know, I would have said it was a copier or a you know, printer or something. I had no idea of the Pricewaterhouse merger and their evolution to consulting and, and cloud and, and what they do. I just, I learned so much about the business. And, and I think the thing that really struck me was how, if you think of like a Ford Motor Company or any of these companies that are, have that longevity that IBM has, they've evolved. And and literally mm -hmm. based on my understanding mm -hmm. of reading the book and what I learned from Ginny uh, doing so, the IBM of today is probably a completely different company than it was 30 years ago. And obviously she detailed pretty well in the book, the role that she played in that. But I just kept going back in my mind of the need for, and you know, we've read some of the books, right? Simon Sinek's long game and some of the others where mm -hmm. companies need to evolve. They need to be very mindful of what their value proposition is to their stakeholders, whether that's customers, whether that's internal, external society in general, because what you're selling or what you're offering today it is probably has a very, very short shelf life. And if you intend to be in the game, in the long game, as Simon Sinek says, you know, you need to be evolving with, with the marketplace. And I thought that was the part that really stuck out in a very positive way. And she did a great job of articulating her role. And then I really kind of took from her, her ability to cast a vision and really articulate a plan. We'll talk about that a little more, but those were kind of my highlights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciated that too. And um, the long game book that we read was the one by Dory Clark. Um, yep, exactly. That, that was, yeah, the um, I really appreciated the. I felt at the end like uh, have hope, like you can impact big things no matter where you mm -hmm. are in in your career, community, all of that. So um, you can um, have power of we, me, and us. I, I really appreciated that. Um, okay, so let's dive in. Um, so one one thing I really wanted to ask because she's really well known for um, skills first, and that's what she's known in the business community for, among some other things. But that's her, you know, um, stake in the ground about skills first. So I was curious what your thoughts were about that. Um, it's um, relevance now. 
um, she does defend having a college degree as well, but she talks about it doesn't mean it's it's for everyone. And then skills first, me um, her her encouragement to not make a college degree uh, mandatory for every job that's posted everywhere at all times, like it has been. And I've seen some changes to that um, on job descriptions and posts and all that. Um, but what are what are your thoughts on the relevance of that of skills first and its application today and any any thoughts on that, um, Dave? You want to go first? I see you're eagerly nodding. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> what's interesting is you you really teed it up well, Kelly. Is you know you are seeing a lot of lot of firms, uh, big players in the game, move away from this dependency of a college degree. Uh, you know, Google is a, a good candidate of that, where they have developed a lot of their own micro credentials and have started to hire people that have simply created or completed some of these micro credentials. Um, you know, the the whole skills first thing, um, you know, I don't know, I'm kind of torn on that. Uh, I had a, a leader in tech tell me this a, a long time ago and it's always stuck with me where uh, we were on a panel and someone said, what skills, you know, and they were asking, you know, what hard and fast technical skills do you want in a candidate coming to your organization? And he said, I don't care. He goes, I don't care what they know. He said, above all else, I want someone who's passionately curious. He said, if you're passionately curious and show me that you have an aptitude and desire to go learn and go figure things out, I don't care what you know. I want to know that you're teachable. So um, that, that's always kind of resonated with me. Um, you know, yeah. It, I agree with the point of, you know, college degree, not for everybody. Also, you know, those of us that, that have been through it in the more traditional route, no disrespect to anyone listening that, that might be a, a biology teacher, but I have a degree in computer science with 10 credit hours in the sciences field that I really need to spend six weeks in a lab dissecting a fetal pig. Um, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I can tell you where the brachiocephalic trunk is and, you know, I can point to the renal pathways and all of those things, but I have never once used that uh, in my career, um, you know, also 15 credit hours in advanced mathematics. And not once have I been uh, had my feet held to the fire and said, uh, solve this Lagrange multiplier or the company's going under. So I think it's definitely time to kind of rethink this, retool and maybe refocus. So I think she I don't agree entirely, but she is on to, I think, something of thinking about what this needs to look like in the future. Mm -hmm. Brett, you want to chime in? Yeah, I, I would. I'd, I'd like to kind of follow on to what Dave, Dave's read there, because as I was preparing, I, I said to myself, Dave and, and uh, Kelly are both professional educators. I wonder where their thoughts will go on this. So it's, it's very interesting, Dave, because I mean, basically you're calling out the institution, which I am completely aligned with. So your question, Kelly, was, you know, does the skills for culture still apply today? And, and my resoundingly, most definitely, and I'm going to drop a, a Jocko reference here, you know, of Rometty taking extreme ownership, right? She said, hey, my company, IBM, has these staffing challenges. We can't fill these open positions. And, and what are we going to do about that, right? The, and so her approach was, you know, as you guys have talked about, eliminating what she called over-credentialing and job descriptions and eliminating this, you know, four-year college degree as a minimum requirement. And then she championed, she went into great detail about IBM aligning with what she called P-TECH, uh, which I, I don't know a lot about PTEC, but the takeaway was it sounded like a skills-based vocational curriculum for high school and then maybe community college age folks. But I think what made it so powerful and what made it so impactful was the fact that she had jobs. I mean, meaningful, life-sustaining. And I tried to think of what the word that that's so common today in, in the lexicon of, you know, what is it? What is a job that pays a meaningful wage, right? And those jobs that IBM offered at the end of the P-TECH initiative were those types of jobs. So uh, again, a, a, a Jocko reference, but she truly ran to the conflict, right? Rather than her mm -hmm. walking around right. saying, hey, we have this problem, we have this problem. She truly brought a solution and she put the power of her company and all the jobs that they had available that those employment opportunities, she truly put those behind them. And then once she had that done, she, she went out and championed other universities, other educational institutions, other community colleges, and then brought along other CEOs to say, hey, in order for this to work, in order for students to see value in investing in themselves and investing this time, they have to see this as a pathway to an opportunity. So mm -hmm. I, I'm convinced that there's a, a need for that. And I think 
it probably is a, a call to action or a wake up call to our traditional four year uh, college institutions, kind of in the same vein that Dave was talking about. And, and I, I would frame it from this standpoint of saying the years or the thought of, of seeing college as four years of enlightenment to find yourself are probably gone or they should be gone mm -hmm. if they aren't. And we have to view college as truly what it is, right? It's a means to an end and that end is meaningful employment. So for the parents out there who are, you know, questioning the, the value and paying for a college education, hey, if my young person, my my daughter or son it, it will get a job out of the deal, I'm probably up for the task. But if it's four years of, you know, may, maybe liberal arts and, and discovery and basket weaving and, and painting, you know, I might have to rethink it because it's now a very, very significant and sizable investment. So to kind of land the plane here, you know, is the skills first culture still apply today? Absolutely. No question in my mind. Okay. Hey, in defense of liberal arts, I was a history major and we didn't take any <laughs> basket weaving or knitting or any of that. Um, no. But it, I, I knew um, I was going to get that from one of you too. I yes. So. <laughs> and in defense of a college education, um, even as, so I'm an MBA professor and Dave is a professor as well. And I, I'm an adjunct to, to be clear, but the, um, what I talk about is that it's not, I'm not so concerned with the the not the information as um, what they think is how they think, and so I do think there's that's the benefit of going and one of the benefits. And so, um, learning uh, critical thinking I think is lacking in society today. So learning that skill and how to do that and not just being told the information. So it's not just facts and information but um, learning how to, how to think, not just what to think. And so I think there is a benefit to that. Um, and she talked about that a little bit and about um, research and advancement and, and some of that, but just not every job needs to have that. Um, and so, and my, well, I, and the if first- I can, If I can reframe, I, I agree with that. And I, I started yeah. to think my youngest daughter, when she went into Deloitte and, and her, her I think they call it a cohort is what they do. But they come in and they basically said, hey, you don't have to prove to us that you're smart. You're in the room. You're, we know you're smart. Now prove to us that you can work as a team. Now prove to us that you can show up on time. Yeah. Show to us that you can meet deadlines, all of those things. And I think to your point, and, and I, no disrespect to anybody in the education field whatsoever, but I, I believe academia and maybe even somewhat industry has oversold the value of a college education. And I think we've got too many people probably attempting to pursue a degree that doesn't lead to to a meaningful job or a meaningful point in society where those yeah. those people, those individuals might have done better or they had they rethought their their path to you know vocation. Mm -hmm. I think that there are studies now where they show the financial implications um, five years after college. So the age of like if you're um, 28 years old versus, you know, 28 year old that went to college and didn't and the debt, the debt that they have versus somebody that went to trade school or started a business or uh, went into the family business and the financial implication is worse at that age. And then it, over time, the college degree tends has tended to even up, you know, they pay that off, pay off that loan and get higher. I, I haven't seen that data in the last 10 years, probably, but um, but the financial implication of that's amazing, you know, huge too. Um, so all kinds of different areas to consider, but I'm glad to see companies are uh, paying more attention to that and taking care in what they're putting in the posts and the expectations. Um, okay, so let's dive into um, this um, second part of the book on um, the power of we changing work. And she shares five leadership principles uh, or five principles. And so I thought for us, we could talk about uh, which one of the five stood out to you? You know, so we didn't pregame, so I don't know what their answers are going to be. <laughs> so we could all, all pick the same one for all I know. But which of the five stood out to you, and then um, why that was, and um, how you use it, that kind of thing. And so for everybody, the five are: be in service of others, build belief, know what must change and what must endure, steward good tech, and be resilient. So I don't know; it's hard to pick. <laughs> Brett, do you want to go first this time? Yeah, I I got to do two of them actually. So, you know, being okay, in well, sales. Okay, we'll pick one first. 
pick All one right, first. I'll pick one first. Yeah. Being in sales, I mean, being in service of others. I mean, there's, there's no way you can be in sales and not pick that one. There's just no question about it. So that's the one I that, could do. Did you? Yeah. I, <laughs> it, it, like I said, that I, I called it a foot stopper, right? I mean, there's just no way you can be successful in, in what I do without truly understanding my own personal value proposition, how it contributes to my customer success. And, and it really all boils down to, in very simple terms, being in service, right? A core tenant of our time mm -hmm. together is leadership development. And, you know, if you're a leader, and in, in, it's commonly said, right, you know you're a leader when your focus shifts, shifts from yourself, from me. And this was, Jimmy actually did this, the me to the we, right? When we shift the focus mm -hmm. from ourselves to our team, and then we become in service of our team, which uh, in turn becomes in service of our customers. So, you know, I started to think of it in, in terms of it being a maturation process, but I want to make sure that everybody gets the point that maturation doesn't necessarily mean age, right? You can be a right. very, very young person chronologically, but be very, very mature. So I, I think that having mentored other leaders and then being a leader myself, I was a very late bloomer in terms of maturity and was probably very immature, you know, for my age and then obviously caught up at the end. But uh, again, making the point there that uh, being in service of others is an evolving process and it has largely to do with maturation and don't be, don't be uh, under the misunderstanding that has anything to do with age because it certainly doesn't. Right. Right. Dave, did you happen to pick that one? I did happen to pick that one. <laughs> um, yeah. That, that, yeah. Um, you know, wow, not not that the other, you know, four were not certainly valid principles, but when when I reflect back on on two things, on you know, peers that I have worked with and leaders that I truly admire, one of the things that they both had in common was they were very generous with their time, you know, service to others, and in this case, me. Um, you know, and I think of you know, one of the leaders that I absolutely respect the most. Um, you know, this individual just always, no matter what, no matter how busy they were, always made time for me, knowing that this person was a level above me in the organization and had way more to do and bigger responsibilities than I did. It didn't matter when I walked in this person's office, you know, that if they weren't in the middle of something, they always made time to help and support mm -hmm. me in, in my journey. Uh, and at the peer level, you know, drawing a parallel to, you know, the author being in tech as well. You know, I remember, you know, my first six months and my first big boy job, as I keep calling it, where I was completely clueless about anything and everything that was going on. And, and the people that, that still have made the biggest impression upon me, again, no matter how busy they were, I would come to them with something I couldn't figure out. They would stop what they were doing, take the time uh, to actually help me. And, you know, what what I really, you know, kind of liked about uh, this book was her telling her story of how she started off, how she, you know, grew up very, very poor. And it, I never, didn't get the impression that she was doing it for people to feel sorry for her. But I feel like people need to hear those stories. And, and one thing I really admire that Rockhurst has done in the past several years is uh, at new st student orientation, they hand out you know, buttons and flyers for students that are first generation college. Oh, and, hmm. and I myself was in that situation and I didn't realize how overwhelming it was you know, to be, you know, the first to go to college. And not that I didn't have the support of my family, but they couldn't tell me what to expect. So, you know, I, I've made it my effort in the classroom now to to ask my students who's first generation college. And, you know, I still see a bunch of hands come up and I say, well, hey, me too. And it amazes me how many students will come up to me after we talk about that and say, oh my gosh, you were first generation college too. Look how far you've come. And I'll say, well, in 20 years, I want to look back and see where you are mm -hmm. and you're going to surprise yourself. So I think it gives people, you know, a lot of hope and, and, a, and a lot of direction, you know, when they get to hear those stories. And I think uh, the author did a really good job of telling hers in that regard. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. I thought you were going to name um, Miles Gartland as the leader who's always there since we slammed education before. We ought to say <laughs> our boss is the greatest boss that ever was. <laughs> we'll find out if he's watching this one. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Miles. <laughs> um, the reason I picked um, this one as well, um, it just struck out everything 
um, about my faith is geared toward everything is about in service to others. So as a Christian, live your life in a Christ-like manner. That's kind of what it's all about. Um, but she talks a lot about it being practical. You know, just it's not, um, I, it's, she didn't mean it the way I took it, you know, when I first saw it. She didn't mean it that way. She just meant like a practical service to others, customer service, um, helping others reach their potential. Um, ex, um, I really like she talked about excel, excel, um, exceed what's required of you. Um, and I kind of liked that instead of just do the bare minimum, you know, or just to check a box, but exceed what's required of you, um, especially in service to others. Um, so I really liked that. I liked to um, find the aha moments as well or help people have those. Um, another one I wanted to point out was, um, and then Brett, I want to find out your last one, but I suspect I know what it is. Um, but the third one, um, the third one is uh, know what must change and what must endure. I've had several comments or several conversations lately with clients about that. So in working with um, leaders on their company cultures, and um, honoring uh, where they've come from and honoring the past, um, but knowing that some of that needs to change and they need to let go of some things where she talked about helping IBM let go of the semiconductor. And uh, to me, when I saw that word even, I was like, oh my God, how long ago is that? You know, like that was in the 2000s and it was, um, but helping companies um, let go of, honor it, but then let go and, and move forward. Um, okay, Brett, what was your other one? All right, I'm dying to know what do you think it is now that you've said that. Re resilience. You're, <laughs> you know me so well. That's amazing. I can't believe you did yes, that. Yes, yes. Oh, my gosh. We've been together so long. Oh, yeah. So yes. <laughs> she hit it. Yeah, but, you know, and the, the lead in here was, you know, which which principle resonated the most. I can't believe you did that, Kelly. And it, mine was resilience, so this idea of responding to change, and, and none of us, uh, you know, will go through our personal professional lives unscathed. It just doesn't happen, right? I mean, if you live a life, uh, particularly if you're stretching, uh, you know, I guess you could play it safe and be conservative, but it's highly unlikely. But it's just not going to happen, right? And that's really what sets us apart is how we respond. And you know, I could spend literally an entire conversation focus on all the setbacks I faced from my young childhood and you know, single parents and then all, all, all the things with uh, my job and, you know, being being terminated at, at an advanced age, all of those things. But what, really what pushes us forward is focusing on what we can control. And I say that all the time, right? What can we control? And then how we respond. And then I always kind of layer in, you know, what other choice do we have, but then to move forward, right? What are the alternatives when you're faced with a setback, right? Sit at home and you know, maybe go into your, your shell and, and none of those are great choices. And, you know, Romani Gina, our author, she, her life was certainly wasn't without challenges. So to think, you know, I want to be the CEO of IBM and, and you think, well, yeah, what price did she pay? And I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean, all the things that she encountered as Kelly talked about a little bit. I mean, when she went through the transformation of IBM, I mean, it didn't go well. I mean, the results weren't favorable initially. I mean, when she went through the PwC merger, she lost all kinds of people that didn't buy into the culture. And you can imagine how that weighed on her. And obviously she had to be confident in her vision, but she's basically betting her career on all these things. So yeah, be resilient was the one of the things that, uh, you know, again, if you really aspire to get to that corner office, you can be assured that you're gonna face maybe not the same things that our author faced, but you're gonna face challenges and, it, and the road will certainly be uh, less than smooth. So yeah, be resilient. That's, that's my second yeah. one. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> well, and um, she says, um, resilience is the most important characteristic along with curiosity for any leader. It's yeah. not exactly what about what you know, it's about those two, resilience and curiosity. Those are things that she says. Okay, so the listeners, I'm gonna invite you, uh, viewers and listeners to close your eyes and think about when you learned the most. So think about a situation that you were in in your career when you learned the most. And it was probably a time when you had to be resilient. It was a time when you went through something risky or something was uncertain and how you came out the other side and, and were resilient through something. So she talks a lot about resilience from uncertainty, not just negativity or hardship, but 
through uncertainty and through taking taking risks and and uh, taking chances. So I love that perspective of it too. Dave, you want to chime chime in on resilience or one of the other ones? You know, I I, I agree. I'd be echoing a lot of what what Brett said, but you know, I think it, it kind of goes back to you know what we we've, we've picked up in other books is you know get get comfortable being uncomfortable. And, you know, we find to your point, Kelly, that's kind of when we grow the most, you know, when I step out of that comfort zone, when I put myself in that situation, you know, when did I learn the most? Well, it's usually when I'm the dumbest person in the room and, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're not learning as much. So I'm always very uncomfortable not knowing what's going on. But when I reflect back, those are the situations when I've, I've learned the most and grown the most. And it's hard. It's hard to put yourself in that situation, but we got to do it. Yeah. And that's when a company can grow too, when you're taking a chance mm -hmm. and Absolutely. risking. And, and, you know, if I put the geek spin on this, you know, what, while IBM has flexed and endured and, you know, they, they've had some stumbles along the way, you know, in, in the tech world, you know, structured qu query language, SQL, was founded by IBM in the 70s. And it is still alive and well today as a structured data language that if you are working in the data space, if you're working with databases, big data, anything that has to do with data and you don't know SQL, you're not working in the business. So that that's something they have mm -hmm. been, uh, in the forefront, whereas, you know, other languages come and go. You know, I, I teach a couple programming languages and what I tell my students is this language I'm showing you today didn't even exist when I was in college. And what I did learn in college, you know, the, the dinosaurs are programming on now. So, um, the fact that, that, yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah, the fact that, that they have had some things that have hung around over time, uh, yeah. this been pretty cool. And I, I shared with Kelly kind of before this started that, uh, I got a chance to hear, uh, Jenny speak at a conference, uh, years ago when she still was the CEO of IBM and, uh, a very dynamic speaker. Uh, so many people attended the fire marshal had to close the doors and stop letting people in. So it was a, a highly sought after keynote session and it was uh, kind of fun to watch her work. So. That's amazing. Yeah. I don't know. I've seen a lot of speakers. I don't think I've ever had the fire marshal have to come. <laughs> and I've been a keynoter at a lot of events and I've never had the fire marshal come for my mind either. Me either, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Uh, well, that's in the interest of time. Let's go ahead and wrap it up. Um, are there um, last comments? Oh, do, did we did we say, would you recommend it? So thumbs up, thumbs down. Would you recommend the book? And if so, who would you recommend it to? Uh, I would I would definitely recommend it, um, especially, you know, uh, she obviously started her journey years ago, but we still need more women, more minorities in tech. Um, you know, her, her story is a good story for anyone, you know, that, that kind of fits that description is, you know, as a guy in tech, we want you, we need you, um, you know, there, there's a place for you. So, so come on. So yeah, definitely recommend. I want to jump in there and say, I'm going to recommend it to, to who Dave said, and also to the guys to read it as well. So you can understand what other people are going through and thinking and, and experiencing and also she really did go into a lot of deal deal detail about the um pwc merger so if you're in that space um or your company might be going through a merger like that you might check it out because of that as well so that's my two cents for that okay brett would you recommend yeah, it couple, and yeah i got a couple key points here so dave's gonna love this right he's our analytics guy on the, on the team here and, and he'll appreciate this but i'm always looking for patterns and you know, a couple of things that you look for, you know, who's doing it better and why, or, you know, how did this company or person win and I didn't, or, you know, what did they do that I can do? Uh, you know, what am I doing that's working and what isn't, you know, kind of what I call keep, stop, start. And so as I reflected on that in Rometty's story, our author, and you started to kind of think, well, what was she doing? What was the pattern? And then I started to reflect on Indra Nui's book and, and there are, there are similarities. And so I'm not going to say yeah. that, you know, it's magic or anything like that. There's a roadmap, but they're, they're pretty similar, right? And, and, and I think this applies to a lot of uber successful, ultra sectoral overachievers. You know, the first one is being almost fanatical about education and lifelong learning. I mean, here's a young lady who comes from a broken home. Literally, her mother's working, I think, multiple jobs. She's taking care of her family, but still manages to go to Northwestern, a highly, highly credentialed and academically challenging university and graduates with an electrical engineering degree with honors. I mean, that is a big, big deal. 
and, and Indra Nui's story is much the same. So that first thing about being fanatical about education and then lifelong learning, and you know, she talks about being continually curious. The second one is the ongoing development of communication skills. She goes to great lengths to say she wasn't a good speaker initially, and she noticed that, she recognized it. I think somebody even gave her feedback, if I remember the book correctly, mm -hmm. and she said, I'm gonna fix that. And she made it, it made her, uh, challenged herself to improve her communication skills. And again, you can see that with Indra Nui as well. And then the value of both being mentored and, and being a mentor, you know, you can see that time again in CEOs. We, there, she even makes mention, I think, of a board member or when she was a CEO where she had a coach. I think she called that out. But we, you know, as Kelly and Dave and I look at different CEOs, there's many of them that have a coach, either a retired CEO or a board mentor. But again, there's three themes there. And then the last one is just creating and nurturing these meaningful relationships. And, and I'm not by being in that CEO role, right? I mean, you give up things or you, there's a price to pay, but even people in her role value the benefit of great relationships. So, you know, I'm making a leap of faith here that everybody's investing their time in our podcast, in our conversation, because they're looking to gain that edge or understand the secret or asking themselves, hey, how did Dave get to where he's at? How did Kelly get to where he's at? How did Brett get to where? And in my opinion, Jimmy Rometty's good power it only reinforced these key fundamentals. And there's probably a couple more. But if I were 30 years old and looking to things that say, hey, how can I develop my offering or how can I expand what I bring to the relation, how would I bring to industry? I would focus on those four things. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, would I recommend the book? Absolutely. There were some sections that got a little dicey for me in terms of uh, diversity. And, and, and I know Kelly's a female. And I think Ginny spent a lot of time talking about the the battle of a female in industry. And and I I like to look past all that and say, I don't care if you're purple and from Mars, if you can do a great job, I want you on my team. And so that, that part kind of slowed me down a little bit, but I did like the part of, hey, you know, there's the cliche, if you fail to study history, you're doomed to repeat it. And we can all learn from what she went through, what she did and how she accomplished it. So my final thought, you know, I like to pull phrases. I'm always looking in the books and trying to pull a key phrase out. And I did that just recently. She had a section in the book, which was a quote from the Wall Street Journal. And it, it, she was kind of said that the people in IBM kind of half heartedly joked that the only word she knew was faster. And it, show me a company, show me a business that's not focused on increasing their sense of urgency and their output. And I'll show you a company that's falling behind. So the, the headline said IBM's chief to employees think faster, think fast, move faster. And I'm, I've already adopted that into my own personal lexicon. So, you know, I doubt there's an organization that couldn't benefit from that heightened sense of urgency. So it's going to be my little personal model for a little bit of oh, I think, love it. move faster. So, yeah, those are my thoughts, Kelly. But yeah, definitely. This was a winner and I would highly recommend it. I love it. Yeah. And the thing about the, the um, diversity related to women, when I was coming up, I thought I was on the tail end of women only. I was a lot of times the only women in a lot of meetings and all of that. And um, I thought I was the tail end of that. But I hear from women, younger women now on their way up where they're still fighting a lot of those same battles that um, that I was um, involved in way back then. So uh, what, what keep paying attention to those about? things. 30s, early 30s, late 20s, early 30s. Yeah, yeah. Um, different not, situations, not as overt. Um, there's not alcohol in the office like there was back in the day. You know, back the, mm -hmm. back in the day, there there's another phrase, right? Not don't say stuff like that. But um, um, well, I yeah, just so reflect pain, on how we raised our daughters. I mean, we raised them yeah. with the mindset of you have to be independent. You have to be you have to be self-sustaining. You're not going into your adult life with the idea that you're going to depend on, and they're both girls, depend on a husband or depend on a partner. You have to go at it with the mindset that, you know what, you, 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 you don't get, you don't get that crutch, right? You know, we used to joke about getting your MRS degree, those types of things. In my opinion for parents and young people, those days are gone, right? Uh, male, female, black, white, purple, green, uh, find a way that you can bring value and you will be valued. And so I and, learned and I, from and I, don't want, I, I don't want, and I don't want to dismiss the fact that, you know, that people will run into barriers. I, I, my, I don't want to make light of that because I, I know some of that comment could come off that way. And that's certainly not my intention, but it's, a, it's, and I think from an employer standpoint, we just need great people. And, and I don't really, I really don't care where they come from. I just want them to bring their best to the business every day. And I truly yeah. believe that if we can do that, they'll be valued. 
and um, and just recognize that not everybody thinks the same way you think. But taking taking what you how you raised your daughters and what you said about their they um, are de- independent themselves and not depend on a man and their MRS degree. Um, my yep. parents also taught me not to depend on a company. So to have, yep, to have money so you're not dependent on the job so that you can make your own decisions as well. So another another uh, layer of all of that. Um, the last thing I wanted to share was what blew me away at the very end of the book was almost literally the last line um, where she says, um, that if you have a, a passion or mission for your own work, that's a culmination of your life experiences. She says, I urge you to pursue it. Don't de- don't be intimidated by the scope of your aspiration or the magnitude of its challenge. I just love that. Don't be intimidated by the scope of your aspiration. Like you think, oh, I couldn't do that. You know, there's no way I can do that. That's too big of a challenge. Um, don't don't be led to think you can't make a difference. Trust your heart and consider how the principle can be used over and over and bring your vision to fruition. Good power is simply a way to do hard, meaningful things in positive ways. So don't be intimidated by your own, the scope of your aspiration. If you have that aspiration, it's there for a reason. So I love that. So Did think you catch fast. The, page, the last page where she wrote out that personal note. I thought, you know, we how many books have we read? 26, 27. And I mean, read hundreds more beyond that. I've never seen an author yeah. that pen a personal note at the end of the book. That was yeah, I loved it. And the whole point of that was you, you'll be judged based on how you do things, not just what you do. Right. Mm-hmm. Daniel Kahneman, I don't think, is ending his book with a note. And this is the one we're talking about next month. Thinking fast. So fast. Here's our. Thinking fast, we're on our a theme. Thinking fast and slow. <laughs> so that's our book for Mar for March, March twenty eighth. So we will be back March twenty eighth, twenty twenty four. And this is our book. It's thick. That's why we've talked about it a few months. And it's mm. a small font. So get on it soon. <laughs> Don't wait till the the last minute. Uh, so that is it for us for today. So thank you both for joining in this one. And uh, look forward to our conversation next month. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. See ya. Thank you all for thank you for watching uh, live or the broadcast. Thank you.